prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Help us now to serve you and to learn something from the message that we have here as we go through the Psalms. Pray, Lord, that you'd work in our lives. Help us to be the kind of Christians we ought to be for your sake. For the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, those of you who are going to kids' church, you can go. And uh, we do have a one after this fall, ten- tentatively, Sunday morning, September the 29th, the last Sunday of September. We're going to have a fellow by the name of Boris Golden. And he is going to be doing a Seder, the whole Passover Seder for us. Yes, he is. Yes. And uh, he won't be doing the Lord's Supper explaining. And he'll actually, will pro- it'll probably be over in Fellowship Hall. And he's going to go through and do the short version, not the four hour version. But he'll do the 45 minute, one hour version of this. If you were a Jewish person at a Seder, this is what we do. And I, I ask him about that because it's good for everybody to sit through one of those to see exactly. And we've explained how things are, what they represent, all that enough. I think everybody knows that. But yeah, I, I, I want to do it with us because we haven't done it in 14 years. So uh, it'll be a good thing to have. And uh, so he'll be here tentatively uh, September the 29th. Okay. Um, other than that, we just have our, our. It's close to it. September the 29th is Sam's birthday, and he'll be he'll be 29. No, 20. Yeah. Yes, he'll be 29. And um, if you go back on your calendars for what it's worth, September the 29th. Uh, was the Feast of Trumpets in the year 3 or 4 B.C. kind of a thing. Uh, it depends on how you look at your calendar. So uh, that's, that's good. Anyway, uh, on our notes here for the upcoming events, there's no Sunday evening services the rest of the summer. Father's Day is coming up on Sunday. And uh, then Crossway Picnic, Bring Your Own Meat, uh, on the 4th of July. Okay? And so that's all the announcements that I know of, uh, unless I've missed something, okay? If you need a handout, they're up here, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 65 tonight, and we're going to pick it up where we left off two weeks ago before I went on vacation. So we're on verse 4. So two weeks ago, I got three verses done, okay? And if you want a handout, they're up here. I already said that. All right. In verse 4, David goes on here, and he says, Blessed is the man whom thou, God, choosest and causest to approach unto thee. Why? That he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of the holy temple. So you see here uh, the small print words. Those are words that have been added to the translation so that the English sentences make sense. So if you just read the, the dark words, blessed... Thou chosen and causes to approach, he may dwell. You have to throw some words in there to make the English actually make sense. Okay, And one of the things we need to understand, though we won't come to a great academic understanding of this and, and, and mindset of it, but we do need to understand that when a person who's not English is listening to their language, especially some of the ancient languages, for and I'll just give you the illustration. We know in the Bible the guy Noah. And we look at the word N-O-A-H. Oh, there's Noah. That's who that guy is. So we say Noah, and we all know who we're talking about, the guy in the boat, right? But if you're thinking in an ancient Hebrew mindset and you hear the word Noah, you don't think, oh, there's Noah. That's his name. You're thinking, there is son of comfort. You're thinking of the meaning of the word. We transliterate it, as it were, to what the actual sound of it is. So when you are looking at the Uh, ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek, it's important, if you can, to do the word study, if you'd like to, to find out what the syllables actually mean. If you had a Jewish mindset, how would you hear this? Because it makes a big difference in your understanding of it. Now, reading it just in the English, you're not going to get way off on the Pluto somewhere, but you're going to miss a lot of the depth and the intricacies of the meaning. But you're going to get the the general attitude of it. Uh, It's not a big mystery, okay? But uh, there we have the uh, definition of some of the words and so forth. But blessed means to be happy, to be envied, to be in a position that other people want to be in. 
Blessed is the one that God chooses, and not only chooses, but causes to approach that he may dwell in the courts and in the house. God says, come, come in. This is the house of God. Come in. Happy to be envied in an in enviable, enviable position is a person who will come and fellowship with God in the church. Now, they would call it the temple back then. It's not a big deal. But where else would you have more Christian fellowship, theoretically, than in the church? And if you come to church and it's always strife and, and, and confusion, something's not right with the body of Christ. We should be able to come to church to fellowship. Okay? And God wants to be the center of that fellowship. Not us being the center of the fellowship because you're my friend and you're my brother and you're my relative and it wasn't a great time we had at work yesterday. Or, though those things can be talked about, what's the fellowship really in? What's the Bible say? Our fellowship is in the Son. It's in, it's in God. Okay? So, David starts with this. Well, he actually started a couple of verses ago, but he gets into this. Where should we be having fellowship? In the house of God. That should be the center of our fellowship focus. David knew God caused the possible uh, connection between God and mankind. Now, that is something to understand here. Is there a possible relationship between us and God? Who initiated that possibility? Not us. On our own, we would never seek for God. One of the uh, interesting questions, there's more than one, but one of the interesting questions when, when, I'm, when I have talked over the years with uh, atheistic people and evolutionary-minded people and all that kind of stuff is where does morality come from? And you'll find that more and more and more society is going the way of the evolutionary thinking of there is no morality. It is a false construct that we make, and basically, when you get right down to it, whoever's got the most ability to force their will is who's right. And so you take that back in the Old Testament and see what the Bible says about it. It says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That is the, that's the, the, the biblical verbiage to say, everybody thought whoever could do it the way they wanted to had the right to do it the way they wanted to. There was no rule. There is no, there, the only reason we have in, in the evolutionary mindset, when you get right down to it, the only reason we have any kind of laws that keep us from killing each other is because we have agreed not to kill each other. But as soon as somebody comes along who can implement their will on people, they can kill who they want and it won't matter. Okay? Because they've got the strength and you get right down to it. What's evolution say? Survival of the fittest. If you got killed, obviously you weren't fit. Well, we would never do that. That is the nuts and bolts of their thinking. And so what do we have? We have genocide and euthanasia and abortion and all that kind of stuff. It's just the trinkling in of that whole mindset. Anyway, David knew that God was the one who caused the possible connection between God and man. It was God reaching down, not man reaching up. Connection begins... When God calls an individual to come to him. Now, to whom did God make that call? Everyone. He invited everyone. So it begins when God calls the person, and God calls everyone. And when he calls them, thus he enables, God enables that person to come. He doesn't invite people and then turn them away when they show up. He enables the person to dwell contently in his presence, in his courts, in his tabernacle. Okay? Remember, the, uh, in, uh, in various uh, languages, you get a different word, but they come out meaning a lot the same. But uh, the Bible tells us in Isaiah, uh, when the child is born of the virgin, you'll call his name Emmanuel. Which, what's the name of that? God dwells with us. Okay? We didn't go dwell with God yet. He came and dwelt with us. He's making the connection. Once accepted and established, once, once I, I'll use me as the illustration, once I accept God's calling, the connection between God and man brings satisfaction. And as we've talked here before, the only thing that can satisfy an eternal soul is an eternal solution. And because everything I am involved with and in, everything I do is temporary, I can only satisfy my temporary human being 
part of me. I can't satisfy my soul. And a person who denies uh, God will always live with that need. Uh, they can be happy, humanly speaking. They can, ha- they can be nice people. Can an atheist be a moral person? Yeah. They, all atheists are not murderers. Okay? But there is something missing. The only thing that can bring them contentment, happiness, satisfaction are temporary things. And so you'll find, if you ever have a chance to talk to to these folks, uh, when it's all said and done, when we die, we're dead. There's nothing else. I've just convinced myself of that. That's what I want to believe. I don't want... Why? Because there is no real satisfaction. Okay? The accepted experienced God's house, those who accepted God's will, God's call, those who accepted it, experienced then in God's house, in God's dwelling, a place of goodness that was received. And again, as we apply it to ourselves, I can't speak for you. I don't know what goes through your heart and through your mind. But when you come to God's house to worship God, to commune with other believers and to fellowship in Him, I'll speak for me. I find it quite pleasing, quite exhilarating. I want to come back. Not, I know not everybody feels that way, some, because some people, uh, I'm painting with a broad brush, so, uh, but a lot of people, they look at church as just another aspect of their social calendar. I go there and I have friends there. And if I don't like the friends that are there, I'll go someplace else. And again, I'm painting with a broad brush, but that's not why a Christian ought to go to the house of God. They should come to the house of God to fellowship with him. And if you're fellowshipping with him, and I'll give you an illustration, example, if this fits, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Have you ever been somewhere, could be a work outing, a social event, social activity, whatever it is, and there's a lot of people there, but you're sitting over in one area with the one or two people you fellowship with. And everything else is going on. Why are you sitting with the people with whom you're sitting and talking with them? And, and you, you go home and it was a great time. And 99% of the people over there you didn't say hello to. But you fellowshiped with the people that you had something in common with. And the rest of the people, you may know them. You may have a little bit in common with them. And again, the example I give is uh, when I went to, I think it was my, my high school's 20th reunion. I know all the, I, I knew everybody was there. I knew them by name. They knew me. We, we were school associates. We weren't chums, friends, or acquaintances. We were just, a, we went to the same school. We knew each other. And we didn't hate each other. We didn't love each other. We just, but I s- sat around and talked about three or four of them that I was close to or had something in common with, but I had never been close to him in high school. Now, why are we here in church? I've mentioned this before. If it wasn't for the fact that we're fellowshipping in God, what do we have in common? Not a lot. I don't play tennis, Jamie. I don't do yard work, John. I don't go fishing. I don't go hunting. I don't work on cars. I buy guns, but I don't shoot them. But if the zombie apocalypse ever happens, I've got them. I know how to shoot them. I used to shoot them all when I was a kid. But I go, I go home and I sit in my room and I watch TV and I play solitaire and I do my Bible study and I practice my guitar a little bit. And my life is different than y'all. But then we come here. We fellowship in something that we have in common. The most important thing we have in common. And that's what David's saying. He says, blessed are those, happy are those, to be envied are those who have been called and have accepted and now they're fellowshipping in the presence, in the, in the reality of God. Well, we're on verse 5. We talked about the house of God, now we're talking about the creation of God. By terrible things, David says, in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation. You are the one, the confidence of all the ends of the earth. 
and of them that are afar off, those upon the sea. When it says terrible, we think of terrible as something bad, and, it's, and, and it's, we understand it, but terrible just means that which brings, wow, it's, it's, we, we, today we use the word terror always as a frightening thing, and therefore we call it something scary. It's, it is awe-inspiring. It is, catches your breath. It, it's unexpected. And David's saying, by the, by the things that we didn't, we didn't think we were going to see it. I mean, picture yourself as a Jew coming out of Egypt at the Exodus. And you're standing there on the, on the uh, Sinai Peninsula. And you see the water in front of you, the, the mountains on the side of you, and the desert on the other side of you. And you look around, you turn around, you see, you see Pharaoh's army behind you. And you're worried about what's going to happen. How many of you are now expecting the ocean to just split? That's a terrible thing. Not bad. It's never expected that. And God just stand still and watch what I'm going to do for you. See my salvation. Okay? So David says, in the terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us. We're asking you for something. I, I watched a show last night. Uh, it was kind of interesting, and it's on uh, Amazon Prime, I think. I can't remember. It could be Netflix. But it's an interview with God. Anybody ever seen that? There's a reporter, and he is interviewing God. And so they sit down to interview, and the reporter says, well, why am I here? He says, you asked for an interview. I, I came because you asked. And so it, it's really kind of an interesting kind of a thing and it takes three days in the, this guy's life where God's trying to well, and, the, and then the guy well you always just you never really answer me well what have I not answered I'm just not giving you the answers you want you ask me here it is so it's really good I, I suggest watching he says in terrible things you have answered us God will always answer us but in oftentimes I would say most of the time in a way that we weren't expecting it to be answered. I'm not God. You asked me to come help you with something. I'm going to come over with my rake, or what, my broom. What are we supposed to do? If, if, if you guys asked me to come over and help you with your yard work, and I, I drove up and my, I was wearing my good clothes, and I went, snapped my finger, and the whole yard looked like beauty, w would you be astonished? Be because what would you be expecting to happen? Okay, that's kind of out of the way, but I, I show up and I have 15 guys with me and they've got all kinds of stuff. Would that take you by surprise? They're going to do this. God says, I don't always answer the way you think. I don't just show up with my shovel and my gloves. Sometimes, faithful, remember, faithful is he who called, he'll do it. Well, how will he do it? Not the way you will. So by terrible things, he's out of, out of the ordinary, things that really catch us by surprise. Thou, the confidence of all the ends of the earth. Notice David is saying, God is the God of everywhere. To the ends of the earth. To them that are far off upon the seas. And, and therein is a Hebrewism, if you will. When the Bible talks about different people and talks about people of the land and people of the sea, it's talking about specific groups of people. Israel is almost always referred to, if it's going to be an idiomatic use, they're always the people of the land. Non-Jews are people of the sea. When you get into the book of Revelation, it says there was a first beast and a second beast. One came out of the land, one came out of the sea. It's important to know that one's, a, one's Jewish and one's Gentile. Those kinds of things. So he says, David says, but God, you're the God of everybody. In the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that there will be non-Jewish people who are going to be part of the family of God. It doesn't say it in those words, but it, frequently it talks about those who come to accept the, the, the Jesus, the, the Messiah of the Jews. And when Paul gets converted on his way to Damascus, he comes back and says, you've heard it read. This is what it's talking about. So we see the Gentile world does not replace the Jew. The Gentile world was always prophesied that they would be included in it. Okay? So the people that were far off upon the sea. This was an ongoing confidence in the, cons uh, the continuation of God's goodness. God had answered prayer and provided atonement. David accepted and he expected it and he anticipated. Now, expectation and anticipation are almost the same, but they're different. You can look those up. When you read your Bible, when you pray, when you're trying to develop your relationship with God, 
expect something to happen. Don't pray and then sit back and say, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. No. What did you pray for in this movie, the, the interview with God? God asked him, well, what, what did you ask? Well, I wanted answers. He says, I'm right here. Ask me a question. And then guess it on your paper there? Just cross out question number three. You don't want to ask that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. So anyway, David expected and he anticipated God's awesome deeds to continue. David had realized what God had done with him and with the Jewish people in history, and David expected it to continue and anticipated it happening. This anticipation and expectation is what is meant in the word hope. Now, again, we think of the word hope of I wish, I hope, you know, it might come true. I'm really, it's not what it means. I'm expecting it to happen. I am anticipating, I'm planning on it. David saw beyond Israel to the ends of the earth, the seas afar off. Though Israel belonged to God in a special sense, God is the God of everything, of everywhere. When Jesus came and died, the Son of God came and died on the cross, he died for the sins of everyone, not just the Jewish people. So David recognized this back then, even to, even, even to the people in the, across the seas. You're the God of everywhere. Moving on, verse 6. He goes on then, which by his strength set fast the mountains, being girded with power. Now, uh, if you want to do any geological studies and stuff, I, I find this kind of interesting. I was down in Mexico a number of years ago, and uh, they were, there was a building going on in this mountain. And you walk up to the, well, this pulpit, we'll say, is the mountain. And I, I, I'm not a geologist, so I couldn't tell you the exact work of it. But you could go up to the mountain. I mean, it's a big stone mountain. You could go up there and you do like this, and you could just crumble the mountain off. It was real thin, paper-thin layers of shale as best I can describe it. And the mountain was huge, and they were building a building on top of it. And you could go up there with, not, don't even have to have a hammer with your hand. You could do like this, and you could put a hole in it. And they said, well, we had to drill down and put in poor concrete. And, oh, okay. And for all of this to wear away like that, several hundred yards before you get to where the structure, okay. But have you ever been to any other mountains that are granite? They're just hard as a rock, as they say. David says, you, by your strength, you gird with your power the mountains. I find it interesting. I don't, I don't doubt, I, I'm not going to argue about whether or not mountains are getting taller in some places and shorter in some places as the tectonic plates hit, bump into each other, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that is most likely happening to a degree. To say that once upon a time the whole earth was flat and over billions of years, you know, the mountains are as tall as they are. Everest is as tall as it is because the tec tectonic plates, and it's only increasing by half an inch every 10 years, so it must be a bazillion years old. Could it ever have risen faster when they pushed together? You yeah, could, but that doesn't give us enough time, which is a whole other subject. But just for just. If you took every atom in the universe, and there's a formula that figures out about how many there are, and don't quote me on this, I think it is one atom times 10 to the 157th power or something like that. It's a phenomenal number. If Anyway, if you took all of the atoms that are in the universe that we know of and moved them at the speed of light and they banged into each other, we don't have enough time for them to bang into each other enough times to make one protein, much less the amino acids and the life. Ergo, we have string theory or M theory, as some people call it, where we are the offspring of a universe that already went through part of that. So we, we, got, we were born already down the road, but that universe didn't have enough time either, and so it was born of another, so you have to, it never answers the question, just, well, it's happened before. How many times? Well, we don't know, as many as it needed. Because time is the answer. Anyway, David says, God, you have the strength. You have the vigor. You have the force. You have the, the ability 
to put all of it together and hold it together. And what's the Bible say elsewhere? It says, everything, I'm paraphrasing, everything in the universe will be held together until God lets go. And the elements will melt with a fervent heat. And that's why today we can describe all kinds of stuff about gravity, but we can't explain it. I challenge you, go find, go find a book somewhere where some brainiac scientist actually explained what gravity is. They, they don't. They'll tell you how it is and what it does. And it's a force. But what is it? What causes it? Well, you know, this thing over here has mass, and this one, they attract each other. Why do they attract each other? We don't know. We just know what they do, okay? And that's like, that's true about a lot of things. We know how it acts, we know how it interacts, we know what it does, but we don't know why it does it, okay? Mountains, sometimes it's mountains, singular, sometimes mountains, are terms frequently used as symbols for authority. The Bible often talks about the hill of or the mountain of, and it's talking about a kingdom or a nation. So in this, God with his strength holds it fast, and the Bible tells us no power is there except but of God. He raises up whom he will, he puts down whom he will. So in the, an, 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 I'll say it, Dave, the idiomatic usage of mountains, David says every power, every authority is there because of you. You hold it all together. And like the mountains that we talked about before, some authorities you can walk up and just crumble them. Other ones are firm, thick, and, and hard, hard to break down. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. There is no power but of God. Psalm 75, it says in verse 7, God is the judge. He puts down one, he sets up another. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Cast your care, your worry, your hope, your anxieties on him. He has your best interest in mind. That's how that reads out if you transliterate it to a, how, what the meaning is. And verse 7, we'll stop here tonight. David goes on. Not only does he have the, the mountains settled, he says, You still the noise of the sea, the noise of their waves, the tumult of the people. Notice he talks about the waves and he explains what he's talking about. He's using an analogy of the waves and the sea being tumultuous. And he's talking about, really it's people all I'm talking about. And it's a very interesting thing. Uh, we don't notice it as much because it doesn't happen as much. But the ground that you walk on is not still. It, it is moving. But it, it happens so slowly and so we don't watch it. But if you could speed lap the time of it. How many of you ever seen those nature shows where they show, here's the glacier. It's moving like a, an inch every decade. But they have a fast film thing on it. It's just going down. Well, if you could do that with, with dirt, you'd see it moves. But now you want to really see how it works, go watch the ocean. The o it's just jumbled up. And David's saying, that's the way people are. You still the noise of the seas. You calm the noise of the waters. The tumult of the people. People are like waves on the water. They're, they're not solid. They're not stable. They're not foundational. But you can still them. You can calm them. Then again, you have to go back to what we started on, verse 4. What people is he, talk is he talking about specifically? Those who come to fellowship with him. Outside of the fellowship of God, what are the people like? Waves tossed about, blown around. Okay, and the Bible refer, it references that type of a thing in several different places. Okay, so we see that in coming to God for fellowship, you have stability and happiness and joy. You are in an enviable position. Outside of that, you're like the driven waves. So David says here, you have the ability to still the tumult of the people who are not stable. Comment here, God's might is shown in his ability to quiet not only the oceans, but also the noise of the people of the world. Now please understand this. It does not matter who the president is, or who the vice president is, or who the queen of England is, or who's running Russia. Do those things have an effect on our daily life to some degree? Yes. For the most part, can I really personally, me, myself, I, can I do anything about who, who it is? Do I have any say-so as to what Putin does? Do I really have any say-so as to what Trump does? Well, every four years I can vote for him or something like that. 
But that's about it. Same way with, you know, Bush or Obama or anybody else. I really, here's a little clue for you. Who is your representative in Washington? When was the last time you sat down and had to talk with them about anything? Really, how much influence do you have? How much, how much communication do you have with the local city manager, the county people? Not much. Okay? But no matter what it is, no matter how you feel about it, if you feel hopeless about it, God says, I'm in control. Fellowship with me. I raise up whom I will, I put down whom I will. I'll take care of this. If my people, which are called by name, will, will humble themselves and acknowledge me and get away from their sin and do right, I'll take care of them. Now that was a specific promise made to the Jews about their land, but it's applicable to Christians everywhere. Okay? Understand the mindset of the people. Read that. I'm just reading it to you there. Understand the mindset of the people to whom this was originally written. Pagan mythology referenced the sea with chaotic, life-threatening powers. You go to, go to any mythological study you want, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, doesn't matter. The sea is always tumultuous and, and dangerous and full of sea beasts and so forth. And so the Hebrew people have this as a commonality. Here today, not that you have to be worried or scared or anything, but you're going to walk around town, you're going to go out in your backyard, you're going to get in the swimming pool, at your house or at the clubhouse or your neighbor's house, whatever. Are you worried about anything as opposed to it's shark season out in the bay? You drive your car down the road, you do it every day, it's no big deal. You have a boat, you're going to go out in the, go out in the gulf, what do you do? You spend three days making sure it works. Everything's right. We are much more cautious when we get on the water. Because if something goes wrong, I can't walk home. So I have to be care careful. And in ancient mythology, and even in mythology today, the oceans, the seas are always des described as being tumultuous and unyielding and un untamable. Okay? Israel knew that the Lord created everything and established his rule over everything. So did he control the seas? Yeah. The Bible tells us, God says, I have set the boundaries of the, of the waters, but they go no further. So the waves come up and they go back out. Waves come up and they go back out. God says, that's the way I'm going to have it. Okay? I want to get into storms and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that at a different time because there's a biblical answer for all that. So David understands this. Now, we'll, we'll stop in just a second, but I want you to understand. I want you to try as best you can as often as you can, to try to have a mindset, in this case, of an ancient Hebrew person in the days of David. How did they think about things? Okay? Um, I, I preached a message, you guys might remember. They did not know. They did not understand. Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to rise again. And they did not understand. We look at it and say, how can they not understand? It's very plain what he says. When he told them that, what had they been thinking? Their whole lives, what have they been thinking? The Messiah is going to show up and get rid of Rome. What about the suffering Messiah? The Jews teach two Messiahs. He said, no. I'm going to suffer for you. We don't understand that. Well, we have hindsight to look at it. But how many things do we misunderstand in Scripture based on how we have been raised all our lives? Things that we do, experience every day, and you try to put a biblical application to it, and we, I don't know how that fits. Why? Because we're used to things. So try as best you can, if you can, to get into the mindset who wrote it? Why did God chose that person to write it? To whom were they writing it? When the person to whom they were writing it read it, what did they think? Again, remember, oh, Jews, 
Moses was not a Jew. He was a Hebrew. There is a difference. When Moses was called, there was no such thing as Judaism. That started after they left Egypt. So when they made the golden calf, I'm not excusing it by any stretch of the imagination, but when they made the golden calf at the bottom of Mount Sinai, what were they doing that for? It's, what they'd, it's the only thing they'd ever known. Not excusing it. Are they accountable for it? Yes. But what have you done or what might you do in a given situation because it's all you're used to? What's the Bible say? Think before you act and ask God. Is this what I'm supposed to do? Well, it must be all right because after all, this is what we've always done. It's not always the case, okay? As my dad used to say, and I, every now and then you need to stir the pot just so it doesn't burn on the bottom. Mix things up, check it out. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 22, it didn't go through the whole thing, but it says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today for the Egyptians that you have seen today, you'll never see them again. And the children of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters a wall to the left hand and the right hand. And when the, he, when the Pharaoh and his tr troop tried to get through there, what happened? They drowned. The, wall, the walls of water caved in and drowned. So for those who want to think, well, they were just going through this mucky marsh thing. The Bible says they drowned in the depths. It's hard to drown a couple thousand soldiers and their chariots and their horses in a waist-deep swamp. Okay. Verse 8, we won't go into tonight because we're out of time. But we'll pick up here next week, Lord willing. Okay? Any questions? Any comments? All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and we will stop. Dear Lord, we thank you again. We pray that you'd help us to serve and honor you. Help us as we go through the Bible to understand it and really think about it so we can, we can rightly divide it. For it's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. All right. Floyd will have the offering plate there at the back. And as you are leaving, you can give him all your money. Okay? And uh, if you want to come up afterwards and learn how to play Faith of Our Fathers, there's three chords on the guitar, and you could learn it and play for the first time and have it right. You are dismissed. <laughs>